All right, we want to welcome you tonight, those there in Stanford, Nebraska, and uh, we're continuing our study of the book of John. We looked at the first 10 verses of John 20 last week, and this week we'll look at uh, verses 11 through 23. And uh, let me say this to start off with. Tonight's lesson uh, deals with one of the most precious events in all the history of the world. You say, Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you why. Had Jesus just died and shed his blood on Calvary, uh, we wouldn't have any hope tonight. But because he raised again on the third day, that's what makes uh, our salvation uh, worth shouting and worth living for. Because uh, we serve a risen Savior. And uh, I like those two songs, and we only sing them, seems like, at uh, Easter time. I like that song, Up from the Grave He Arose. And then I like the song that he lives. And, uh, you know, we do have a song to sing. I see people walking around day by day, and, and uh, they've got a, a kind of a frown or a scowl on their face and uh, nothing to rejoice about. And, uh, man, I tell you, I'm glad that I can rejoice in him. Nothing good I've done but what Christ has done for me. But uh, great, great event. And, uh, you know, sometimes when we read the Bible, we read things, and we just kind of try to get through them because we want to get our required reading done so we can tell the preacher that uh, we read through a Bible this year. Well, uh, I got over that a long time ago. And uh, I do read through my Bible. Most of the time I get through it twice a year. Uh, and uh, I like to study the Word of God and I get hung up on words. And when I see a word I don't understand, I begin to search that word all the way through the Bible. And by the time I've done, I've uh, done spent 10 or 12 hours in the Bible not even realized it. So, uh, uh, God's Word's good, and uh, I hope you're not one that just reads and uh, doesn't uh, absorb what they read. Uh, and uh, think about what we're going to study tonight, the uh, very first appearance of the resurrected Savior. Uh, up from the grave He came, and uh, He's going to be seen here. And, you know, God's uh, power and God's uh, ability to do things uh, never ceases to amaze me. Uh, he's always on time. Uh, I, I kind of put it like this. He's always on time, in time, at the right time. And uh, he'll always be there. And I'm thankful that he's faithful, even when we're not. Now, his first appearance was not to any one of the pious and religious groups. Think about who he came to and who he uh, visited first or allowed first to see him when he rose <coughs> Excuse me, from the grave. His first appearance was not to any one of the uh, uh, political or regulatory groups. And uh, you have a lot of them tonight. Uh, uh, every political group, uh, they want you to do everything that's politically correct. Okay? And uh, so uh, uh, he didn't appear to those groups. Uh, his first appearance was not to any one uh, of the proud or the refined groups. Uh, Jesus appears to all people. Uh, in their need and in their, in their time. But his first appearance was to someone who professed her love for him uh, because he had redeemed her soul uh, from the depravity of sin. And uh, you say, well, preacher, I wasn't that bad a sinner. Well, uh, I don't believe God sees any big sinners or little sinners. I believe he sees sinners as sinners. And uh, he died for the one who... Uh, was the vilest sinner as well as he did for the one who maybe had not uh, been in the, the depths of sin. But still, without Christ, we would be lost and undone. There are some who think that she was a former prostitute, but the Bible uh, says no such thing. Uh, read your Bible. When someone preaches, follow along behind them and see what they're preaching, see what they're teaching. Right. Make sure it's the truth. And, uh, you know, it's not known uh, when she was born or where, uh, that's not mentioned in the Bible. It's, uh, it is the thought that she may have been uh, uh, from the town of Galilee. She could have lived where Jesus uh, uh, walked. Uh, it's not known when she died or where she died. Uh, that's not important either. It, that's just the fact to know that uh, she was uh, born again. She was saved. But we do know that Jesus had cast out seven devils uh, or demons uh, out of her life. In Luke 8, 1, it says this, And it came to pass afterward that he went uh, throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of uh, the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. 
Uh, Luke 8, 2 says, And a certain woman, and this is who we're talking about tonight, uh, Mary or Miriam, uh, he says, And a certain woman which had uh, uh, healed of uh, evil spirits and infirmities, uh, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom seven devils uh, was cast. Uh, you know, she, she knew what the Lord had done for her. Uh, how many know tonight what the Lord's done for you? I mean, can you can you tell somebody? A lot of people say, well, you know, I don't have a testimony. I don't know how to tell somebody how to be saved. Well, just tell them what God's done for you. And uh, I never like to, to go anywhere and not tell the story uh, of uh, the day that I met my Savior. Uh, I was on the West Virginia Turnpike, mile marker number 21, 5.30 p.m. on the evening. It was a Tuesday evening, October the uh, 18th. 1980, and Jesus Christ came into my heart. You say, how do you know that? Well, I was there, Amen. and I've never forgot that. Now, you might not remember the time, you might not remember the day, but I guarantee you'll remember the experience when Christ came in, and He changed your life forever. And you know, uh, as uh, she was the first human to, to see Him resurrected, I, I could just kind of imagine her maybe singing a song. Uh, maybe she was standing there with her eyes fixed on him on that empty tomb and, and she was just uh, singing, I love him, I love him because he first loved me. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe she was saying, well, I'm glad that he purchased me on, uh, uh, with my salvation upon Calvary's tree. Uh, she uh, probably had something uh, in her heart that she was glad uh, to tell others. And, and, you know, I think it's amazing how God loves old sinners. Right. Amen. Uh, God loves old sinners. Right. You know, sometimes the uh, people you want to cast to the curb, uh, that's the ones that uh, God wants you to witness to. I, I remember one time I got up one morning and I prayed right hard and I said, God, I said, uh, uh, I was over in uh, Gatlinburg and uh, I go to my favorite place to eat over there. It's a Cracker Barrel. I love the breakfast. <laughs> and uh, I prayed all morning about, uh, God, let me witness to somebody. Give me somebody to witness to. And uh, I pulled in the parking lot, and there was another couple with us, and I got out of the car, and, and I started in toward the Cracker Barrel, and there was a young couple pulled in, maybe in their uh, late 20s, if they were that old, and uh, they had dreadlocks, and uh, didn't look like they'd washed their clothes in about six months, and uh, I just took off across the parking lot and kind of angled away from them. And just about the time I went to step up on the porch, God said... Those are the ones you're supposed to witness to. I learned a valuable lesson. Hey, God saves old sinners. Hey, man. Doesn't matter who it is. Yeah. And you know, sometimes we want to pass those big people by. Sometimes we want to, uh, you know, uh, kind of lift ourselves up and say, well, we, we weren't that bad. We weren't in that bad of shape. But uh, truth is, uh, we needed saved. We needed salvation. I want to give you four simple thoughts tonight from John chapter number 20, verses 11 through 23. And uh, we'll see, first of all, her standing. Then we'll see her first sight. Then we'll look at her second sight. And then we'll look at her third sight. Now let's open by looking at her standing there. Her uh, return to the tomb is found in verse number 11. The Bible says in John 20, 11, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And uh, as she wept, she stooped down and look into the sepulcher. Now, the Bible doesn't say that Mary Magdalene returned to the tomb, only uh, that she did. Uh, you know, likely she followed Peter and John. We don't know. Uh, but uh, now they uh, have returned to their homes. And uh, the, the Bible says that she stood at the sepulcher weeping. In the uh, Greek, uh, the word there is uh, kagyo, and it's used 40 times in the King James Bible. And uh, in fact, two of the 40 times is found in this uh, verse that we're looking at right now. And uh, that word uh, ko means to sob or to wail aloud. Now, uh, it was the custom in that day, sometimes they paid mourners to sob and to wail right. <laughs> uh, for uh, those that had died. And uh, this was not the case. She had something to, on her mind and on her heart. She surely thought uh, her Savior had died and she'd never see him again. But uh, she was emotional and uh, it was evident on the, on the outside. 
You say, well, preacher, I, we're not saved by emotions. No, we're not. We're not saved by emotions or not saved by feeling. We're saved by faith. But I believe that we've got something that uh, uh, when we're saved, uh, we're going to feel it every now and then. Anybody ever flown a kite? Man, when I was little, I, I used to make my own. I'm going to tell my age now. We didn't have uh, stores where you could go out and buy kites. We would go out and get stick weeds. And we'd slim them down and we'd dry them out uh, in the oven if mom would let us. We usually laid them up on the back of the old coal stove. And uh, we'd dry those things out and we'd get us some string. And used to be the dry cleaners delivered uh, dry cleaning to your house. And it came in a, in a sleeved bag. And uh, it was brown paper and it was real nice for making kites. And I'd mix, mix me up a little flour and a little milk together to make my glue. And I'd get me a string and I'd tie those things together in a cross and I'd put that kite on there. And I'd put me a tail on that kite and I'd get me a ball of mama's crochet thread and I'd get that thing going in the wind and I'd get it going sometimes and I'd add another ball onto it. And sometimes I couldn't even see the kite, it was so far away. You say, well, how do you know it was up there? I could feel the tug. Mm -hmm. right. Amen. Every now and then I feel the tug. Amen. 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 I feel that pull towards heaven. Yeah. Hey, I, I like that song, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are. We, we try to get our tent pegs driven down too deep here, but we're not going to stay here. And I believe the coming of the Lord is, is very close. You say, well, preacher, we, I, I'm just not an emotional person. Well, I've seen some of them who said they weren't too emotional, but you make them mad and see how emotional they are. Right. Amen. Right. They'll give you a, a tongue lashing up one side and down the other. Uh, she was empty, and uh, it was evident on the inside. She, she uh, felt that grief and that uh, pain, that sorrow deep down inside. And two things Mary did that would benefit all mankind. Uh, number one, lingering at the empty tomb of Jesus. You know, too many people never give any thought of what the tomb of Jesus means. Uh, they rush right by, uh, uh, by and uh, never consider what it means to them personally. <coughs> can, can you realize that God has given us victory over death, hell, and the grave? Man, Man I've walked out many times to the graveyard and, and laid a loved one down or a dear friend down in the, in the grave. And, and uh, you know, man, I'll tell you, it just uh, broke my heart to put them down there, but... Uh, man, when I began to read about that resurrection there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and about how this whole body is going to be changed one day and how we're going to meet them in the air. Man, I tell you, it does something for my soul. It stirred me to know that I had victory over death. That's right. And uh, I'm going to tell you, those loved ones one day we'll see again. And I'm glad for that. Uh, not only her lingering, but uh, we see her looking. She was looking for the truth at the empty tomb of Jesus. Now uh, she'd heard him preach and uh, uh, she'd heard that uh, Jesus was going to raise again on the third day and uh, she wanted to know the truth of the matter. She wanted to understand what uh, had taken place in this man's life. What made him so different from everybody else. And it was the fact that he was the Son of God. He was the creator of the universe. Now secondly tonight we'll look at our first sight uh, uh, verses 12 and 13. John 20, 12 says this, And, and seeth two angels in white sitting, uh, the one at the head and the other at the feet, uh, where the body of Jesus had lain. Now, you notice that's the past tense. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, Mary Magdalene looks into the tomb and she sees two angels. And by the way, angels are, angels are messengers of God, or God's messengers. Hebrews 1.13 says, But uh, which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make uh, thine enemies thy footstool? Verse 14 says, Are they not all ministering spirits uh, sent forth to minister for them uh, who shall be heirs of salvation? Uh, you may have uh, entertained an angel unawares. You, you don't know. We have guardian angels. Amen. And... Uh, uh, if you read the story, the rich man and Lazarus, Lazarus was carried uh, uh, by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Yeah. You say, preacher, now you're, you're getting off the deep end here. You're, you're going crazy. No, I'm not. Uh, that's what the Bible teaches. And I believe that there's been a many a time that uh, I've had an angel of God watching over me 
uh, because I'm kind of careless sometimes. And uh, I, I would say you probably are too. And uh, uh, God has uh, sent somebody by in order to help us and, uh, and to guide us. And uh, I remember one case in particular. I had uh, witnessed to a young man that I had went to high school with. And uh, he told me he'd never get saved. Uh, his mama had died of cancer and he was bitter at God. And uh, he'd never get saved. And uh, he uh, had a wife and a little five-year-old daughter. And one morning on the way to work, uh, some months after uh, we visited him and prayed for him and shared the gospel with him, his wife uh, slid off the road and turned upside down in the creek and uh, she was killed in the accident. The five-year-old daughter was trapped in that car. And uh, it was several uh, uh, minutes before they found him and got rescue uh, people there to get him out. And the little girl uh, come out of the car and, and uh, one of the EMTs said, uh, honey, said, uh, uh, we're glad you, we got you out of there. We, we just about didn't get you out of there. And she said, oh, she said, I was all right. Said that man that was in there said, he held my head above water, said, until, until y'all got here. <laughs> Hello. Amen. Hey. Better stop and think. Right. How many times we may have been in a wreck. Amen. Mm -hmm. We may have been in trouble, yeah. and God had a passerby. Amen. Yes, came our way, helped us, encouraged us, and uh, old James got saved. When he heard that story, old James got saved. He got under conviction, and far as I know, he's serving the Lord still today. Amen. Hey, uh, that's what God can do. Amen. Now, she she would uh, be all uh, at. Would, would be all the surprise to find the angels at, at the empty tomb. Think about that. Uh, two angels appearing before her. Uh, there was an angel that announced Mary's coming, uh, Mary's uh, birth, uh, 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 Jesus' birth to Mary uh, when she was, he was conceived in the womb. Uh, there were angels that night in Bethlehem that uh, announced that to the lowly shepherds. Uh, their apparel was white and uh, it represents the holiness of God. And, and you know, if there had been no angels, uh, you know, uh, I, I probably would have been surprised. You know, when, when Christ had uh, been tempted there in the garden and uh, he'd sweat his, uh, great drops of blood falling to the ground, there was an angel that came to him and ministered to him. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all that there uh, should have been angels there uh, at the resurrection. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, uh, heaven takes a vital interest in the Lamb of God. Amen. Amen. Right. You go back in Isaiah and read how they uh, uh, fly around the throne and holler, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Uh, they're there. And you say, well, why two angels? Uh, one at the head, it says, and one at the feet uh, of the body of, uh, of the Lord Jesus. Well, uh, it was a holy place for one thing. And I believe they appear in a holy place. And they symbolize life over death. Uh, we're going to be just like the angels one day. We're not going to have a physical body. We're going to have a body like theirs, and we're going to have uh, uh, eternal life. Uh, that uh, points us out to light dispelling darkness. Uh, it also points out that the Lord's grace uh, bounding over sin. Hey, God's able, God's able to wash our sins away. You know, how do you take uh, sins and uh, wash them in the blood of Jesus and they become white. I, I don't understand that, but uh, I sure do believe it. Amen. He makes us as white as snow. So uh, they, they uh, represent or symbolize life over death. They symbolize light dispelling darkness. And they symbolize the Lord's grace bounding over sin. Now, you think about, uh, I don't know whether you've ever seen a picture of the mercy seat or not in the Old Testament, but uh, there are uh, two uh, cherubims, the one on each end of that mercy seat with their wings outspread overshadowing that mercy seat there. And uh, so uh, it's representative of uh, the, the uh, Trinity of God and the power of God and the holiness of God. In Exodus 25, 18, it says this, And thou shalt make uh, two cherubims of gold, of beaten work, shalt thou make them uh, in uh, two ends of... Uh, in the two ends of the mercy seat <clears throat> and make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof 
And then in uh, Hebrews 9.24 it says this, For Christ is not entered into the uh, holy places uh, made with hands, uh, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Hey, uh, he is there and He takes that rightful place at the mercy seat uh, pleading for you and me. And, and you know, it's, uh, it's illustrative uh, of that which takes place in heaven. Uh, I'm glad I don't have to pray to somebody else. I'm glad I don't have to go to Brother Arville mm -hmm. to get my sins forgiven. <laughs> Amen. Or anybody else. Right. Uh, I can go straight uh, uh, into the uh, throne room of God. Uh, my pastor said he was in the... Uh, in the uh, elevator one day there at uh, Baptist and said he started down the uh, uh, trip there to the bottom floor and said he noticed this guy standing there and said he had on a, a cross and there was Jesus hanging there on the cross and he said uh, I, I, I started not to say anything and said then he said I, I, I believe it was the Lord that punched me he said it might have been the devil but he said I believe it was the Lord and he said I, I looked over at him and said uh, you know, said, I sure am glad he's still not on that cross. How about you? And said, that guy's jaw dropped down said he didn't know what to say. He said, I sure am glad that I don't have to go through some man to get to heaven and uh, go through some man to get my sins forgiven that I can go straight to the throne room through the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And he said, about that time, that uh, door opened on that elevator and that thing pinged and that guy just looked at him and said, huh? and got off the elevator. <laughs> I think he kind of upset him a little bit, maybe. Right. What do you think? Hey, uh, God is holy. Isaiah 6, 1, and I, I love uh, Isaiah chapter number 6. The Bible says in Isaiah 1, uh, uh, 6, 1 through 3, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the, also the Lord sitting upon a high throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. Above it stood seraphims, one, uh, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. Right. Hey, I want to tell you, when we stand in the presence of a holy God and we see uh, our being compared to him, uh, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to tell the Lord a few things. I, I don't believe we will. John the Beloved saw him. John said, I fell at his feet as dead. Right. And I believe that uh, the, uh, you know, the, the awe of God is just going to fill our minds and our hearts and we're just going to bow down before him. Think about that. Now, the question is this. How did Mary Magdalene know where the head and the feet of Jesus lay in the tomb. Well, John 20, 12 says, And see two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Well, she possibly was one of the women who followed Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus when they buried him. Remember, there was two ladies that followed him. In Luke 23, 55, the Bible says this, And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. So she, she had some idea. Uh, she could see the linen clothes lying uh, in their fold and just as she had uh, uh, seen Jesus wrapped in those and then the napkin laying separate. And, and you know, uh, very likely both of uh, these are, are correct, uh, correct as assumptions of Mary. Uh, she, uh, she paid attention. She, she had a desire to know uh, about the Lord. And then we see the angel's response to, to Mary Magdalene here. The angels were, were not revealed to Peter and John, but to the women. Think about that now. That, that kind of amazes me. Uh, we should remember that uh, they were ministering spirits, as we already told you in Hebrews 1. And John 20, 13, it says this, And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Now, Mary's encounter with the angels does not change her mind from the Lord Jesus. Right. 
Hey, she's got her mind set on one thing. I want to know where the Lord is. I'm, I'm not concerned about these angels. They don't, uh, they don't uh, mystify me. She said, I just want to know where the Lord is. That's why I've come here. Hey, you know, sometimes we get too caught up in letting other things mystify us and, uh, uh, you know, not keeping our eyes on the Savior. Uh, that's what happened to Peter when he walked on the sea. Uh, Peter was mystified that, hey, man, look here, I've got, man, I've got a mate, I'm walking on water. And he began to look around and see the wind and the seas, and he began to sink. You know why? Because he took his eyes off Jesus. Yes. Had he kept his eyes on Jesus, I don't believe he'd have ever went down. Right. But he, uh, he got caught up in the moment. Hey, let's not get caught up in the moment. Let's think about him. It's not about us. It's not about uh, mystery. It's about Jesus. Galatians 1.8 says this, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Hey, Paul gives a strong warning there in Galatians about uh, uh, you know, putting anything before Jesus, and there's a lot of people putting things before Jesus today. Right. Can I say right here that it's wrong to put uh, any way of salvation before the Lord Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. Because we're denying the very Word of God when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You say, well, preacher, you're one of them narrow-minded men that believe that there's only one way to heaven. Absolutely. I don't care what Oprah Winfrey says. Right. Amen. Amen. And uh, she'll have her part in the lake of fire one day unless she gets saved. Mm -hmm. I, I pray that she does, but uh, uh, she's one of these New Age gurus. Yeah. And, uh, man, they... Uh, uh, they propagand this stuff all the time to, to people and uh, get in touch with your spirit and there's many ways to heaven. I've heard her say that. Uh, it's not happening. It's one way. The Lord Jesus Christ. So we hold on to that truth. And the angels asked Mary, why are you weeping? Now, in, in, it is the same Greek word, uh, uh, that means to sob or to wail aloud. Hey, she wasn't just she wasn't just snubbing. She was, she was crying. Uh, she was crying. H have you ever seen somebody so emotional over the death of somebody that they just, uh, I mean, just uh, let it all out? I mean, they couldn't contain it. And that's the way she was. Right. And, and the angels know that there's no need to, to weep now. You say, well, why? Well, he's, he's up. He's, he's risen. Right. And it should be a time of praise and a time of rejoicing. Right. But she hadn't realized that fact yet. And, and you know, Mary's reply to them was honest and direct to the point. Mary had come to the tomb to pay her last respects to Jesus and she wanted to anoint him for his burial. Right. And, and you know, her reply was twofold. She said, they have taken away my Lord. They have taken away my Lord. Now, she, she did not know uh, who had done this or why. Uh, she, she was not considering the resurrection. I'm sure she had heard it, but she wasn't considering it. It just hadn't clicked yet. Right. And you know, sometimes our emotions overwhelm us and sometimes things just don't click. You ever been in a real emotional case and somebody said something to you and, and uh, a week later they asked you about it and you say, well, I don't remember you saying that. Yeah. Happens. Right. Amen. And then her... Second reply was this, and I know not where they have laid him. She thought somebody had picked him up and taken him somewhere else. Mary was certain that she did not know what they had done with the Lord's body. Uh, uh, if, she, if it had been someone she knew that had removed it, she surely would uh, go and properly pay her respects uh, by anointing uh, the Lord's body uh, as she'd come to do if she knew who had taken it and where they had taken the body. But she didn't know she was kind of dumbfounded. Then thirdly, we see uh, uh, her second sight in John 20, 14. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and get this, and knew not that it was Jesus. Mm -hmm. And knew not that it was Jesus. Now, before the angels had time to speak, she perceived that somebody else was there near her or behind her. And perhaps, you know, maybe it was a noise. Maybe it was a gesture of the angels. Maybe they kind of looked past her. And, uh, you know, Mary turns and she, uh, through her eyes that have cried to heavy tears, sees a man standing there. And uh, she knows not that it is Jesus. 
Think about that. Now she'd seen him just hours before. She'd walked with him. She'd uh, heard him preach. And how could she not uh, known uh, it was the Lord? Well, let me suggest two or three thoughts here. Uh, she probably was not expecting to see him alive. You know, we think too much in the natural, and that's what she was thinking in. And uh, perhaps she did not look directly at him. That could be the case. It's pretty early. Maybe the sun was in her eyes. I don't know. She, she cried so perhaps that her eyes were so swollen that she could not see clearly. Or, or some other reason that, you know, we simply just don't know. But she just didn't recognize who the Lord was. I kind of feel that uh, he uh, kind of hid himself from her. Uh, there's a couple that are uh, going to meet him on a road to Emmaus, and they didn't recognize who Jesus was. Amen. Till he revealed himself to them. Amen. Amen. Now, the application to us today is how many times have we not recognized the Lord? Because we, for some reason, <laughs> think about this, we're not expecting to see. Huh? You ever go to a church service? You get in that church service? And maybe somebody gets saved and maybe it's the, the worst drunk in, in the community and the preacher preached a good message and you sat there and you folded your arms and you just reared back and said, well, you know, I'm really not getting nothing out of this and about that time that old guy walks the aisle and accepts Christ as his Savior. And you say, well, man, I didn't expect that. <laughs> Amen. I've learned to go to church expecting a blessing. Right. Amen. And an old preacher told me one time, he said, don't, don't come to church with a thimble. He said, bring a bushel basket. And uh, I believe uh, Brother Stan Blue says it like this, God's spoon is bigger than our shovel. Mm -hmm. Hey, He can give blessings. Uh, maybe we're not looking directly to Him. Maybe we're kind of got some fuzzy little thoughts about the truth of the Word of God. Can, can I help you right here? A long time ago, when I got saved, I underlined these words in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God. And I draw me a line over to the left margin, and it's in every Bible I've got. And I put down these words, I believe all the rest. And I've never had any trouble trying to understand God's Word. Now, there's some hard passages. There's still a lot of things in God's Word I don't know. But when I fast and I pray and I need to know them, God will reveal them to me. Right. And He'll do the same for you. God's, uh, God's not, you know, uh, one who's favorites. Uh, he, he gives the same Spirit to all of us. And He'll work through us and work through the Spirit if we'll yield ourselves to Him. Uh, Maybe we're not looking through clear eyes. Maybe our eyes are cloudy. Maybe there's some other reason. Maybe there's a hindrance. Maybe, maybe we've got a little odd against uh, uh, somebody. Maybe there's a, some kind of a secret sin that we're not willing to, to let go of. Hey, it's hard to worship when you're like that. Yeah. Amen. It's amazing what people do at church. I remember one time as a pastor... And I never really like to shake hands before church. Because I've got one thing in my mind when I go to that pulpit, I want to preach. And I've got my mind on my message and, and uh, uh, having a clear shot with heaven. But I walked into church one day and I was getting ready to go to the pulpit and I come out of the study. <laughs> and just as I come out of the study, there was a lady standing there and she took a tithing envelope and shoved it up in my face and she said, Here, preacher, I just wanted to pay my tithes. I'm going up on the parkway and commit suicide. Oh, <laughs> and walked out the door. I mean, it was time for me to go to the pulpit. Well, needless to say, she didn't commit suicide. But, you're talking about putting a damper on the service. Hey, be careful what we're on our mind when we go to church. We ought to go there with the attitude to worship. 
We ought to go prayed up and ready for God to do something in our heart and in our life, and if not, in the life of somebody else. Amen? I want God to speak to me. Amen? Amen? Hey, preacher preached Sunday morning on uh, uh, the church that uh, didn't even know that they needed revival. You worry about his text? Revelation chapter number 2. Amen. Left her first love. Yeah. Amen. They have. Hey, we need to have our mind on worship. Yeah. Jesus asks Mary the same question that the angels ask, and then a, a direct question as to whom she's seeking. Jesus said to her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? John 20, verse 15. She supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. <clears throat> hey, she still hadn't realized. She thought this was the gardener she was talking to. And, and you know, she's thinking again of a dead Savior, and her desire was to anoint him. She had one thought in mind. And, uh, you know, she asked the man uh, who spoke to her in a respectful manner, uh, you know, uh, if he was the one that had taken the Lord away, and uh, she wanted to know where he'd taken the body of Jesus. Then she said, and I will take him away. She was going to handle the body of Jesus. Mm -hmm. In other words, she would uh, take the Lord's body and properly bury it somewhere else. Right. Now, Mary is spoken to again and now realizes that it is the Lord Jesus. 2016 says this, Jesus said unto her, Mary, she, returned, uh, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Think about that. He spoke to her in a voice that she could understand. Now, can I say, God knows you today, God knows your voice, and you ought to know God's voice. Turn to John, uh, John 10, I'm sorry, verse 27. Listen to what the Bible says here. And you take this and write it down, study it out sometime. Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave me is uh, than me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Hey, He knows you. He knows you. He knows your name, your address. He knows the sound of your voice. Mm -hmm. And we ought to know His. And He speaks her name. And, and you know, through her uh, searching and sorrow, Jesus simply says her name. That's all it takes. Mm -hmm. and, and He speaks to Mary using one word, which is uh, the, the name Miriam uh, in the Aramaic. Uh, this is spoken, uh, you know, uh, in, in the name of our family, uh, friends, and the Lord Jesus. And, and no doubt he'd use that, uh, you know, to address her uh, in the past. And Jesus addressed her by, by the native name in her native tongue. Now, I, I usually get in trouble right here. But God don't need for me or you to speak to him in an unknown tongue. Nope. He understands English. He understands Spanish and Russian and Hebrew and, you know, whatever nationality you are, God understands. You say, well, is there a divine language? Well, I've never found it or I've never been given that gift of it as some people say they have. But I'll tell you what, I get prayers answered just talking to Him in English. Ain't that amazing? <laughs> You think if God can create the heaven and earth, surely He can understand us. Right. Amen. Jesus spoke her name. And, and you know what a blessing to hear the Lord speak her name. I mean, that's what she longed for, and it was a, a comfort to her. The Lord Jesus knows us individually. And, and you know, in, in the middle of her sorrow, He simply speaks her name. And in the midst of her searching, uh, he speaks her name. And, and he was justified in ad addressing her in verse 15 as woman. 
Yet now he uses the name Mary. Woman was a common term that the men spoke to the to ladies in, in that day. And she hears his voice and he speaks her name and she responds by uh, hearing his voice and she turns toward him and uh, in the Aramaic says Rabboni, which means master. And the word has a meaning closely identified, uh, uh, if not identical, to rabbi, which Jesus knew the law, so that qualified him to be a rabbi. And... Note that the title Rabboni was given only to a few rabbis. The term was often used in reference to God. In John 10, 1 it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth them, uh, his own sheep by name, and uh, leadeth them out. And uh, when he uh, putteth forth uh, his uh, own sheep, he goeth uh, before them, and the sheep follow him, and uh, for they know his voice. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known to mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for my sheep. And other sheep ha I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, and one shepherd. Uh, therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. Hey, God knows. Right. I, I talked to a man who was a, a, an actual shepherd and I asked him when they come into the marketplace they, they herd those sheep down with those uh, little uh, sheep dogs they have and uh, there's only one shepherd, usually not any other men at all, just, uh, just that man, maybe two or three dogs. And I'm talking about he might have a thousand sheep or more. <coughs> and they just run them in there all together. And he said, uh, we just let them feed there in the pasture. And I said, well, what do you do when it comes time to sell yours? He said, I just walk out. And he said, I speak to them. And he said, they come and they follow me. They know his voice. Right. And we already know where the Lord's voice. Right. Hey. Do you know him tonight? Jesus told her, he said, touch me not. And you know the phrase is the subject of much discussion among Bible scholars. The word touch in the Greek uh, word is uh, uh, hapatomahi, uh, which means to attach oneself or to cling to. Uh, some ladies are pretty bad for that. They just want to grab and hold on. You know what I'm saying? I've seen some guys about as bad too. Amen. <laughs> Say amen, ladies. Amen. <laughs> Matthew 28, 9 says this, And as uh, they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, uh, saying, All hail. And uh, they came and held uh, him by the feet and worshipped him. The word held here is to use strength or to seize or restrain. And... and uh, we also note this, the Lord did not forbid them to touch him as they worship. Later, uh, he will see, uh, we will see that uh, Jesus did not forbid Thomas to touch his side. Remember when he appeared there uh, in, the, in the upper room? Thomas said, uh, hey, I won't believe unless I can, uh, you know, uh, thrust my fingers into his side. But you know what? I don't believe that he did. Because when he saw him, he recognized who he was, and he said, My Lord and my God. Hey, he saw and believed, but Jesus said, Blessed are they who see not and believe. Amen. That's why we are saved by faith. Now, it, it could have been that Jesus was saying to her, Don't, don't hold me or cling to me, for I, I'm not leaving you yet. Uh, you, you, you will have time to, to see me again. Uh, before I go to the Father. Then he says to her, but I, I, I will be going to the Father. And my Father is also your Father. That's what he was telling her in the Scriptures I read to you. And I'll be going to my God, and he's also your God. And, and she must go and testify uh, of him uh, uh, in view of his soon departure to the Father. He wanted her to go and tell the other disciples. Then the Lord gives her uh, the mission that uh, she must perform. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. 
Now, notice the term here, my brethren. That's, that's a pretty firm statement there. Mm -hmm. We become yeah. part of the family of God. We become brothers and sisters right. in Christ. And uh, Jesus also uses the approach to God. Uh, note that He does not just say, uh, you know, uh, His God. He says, our God. My Father and your Father. My God and your God. And, you know, what this means is because uh, of Christ and His relationship uh, to God, uh, His Father, and, and to God, His God, uh, we have the same personal relationship. Thank God that we can do that. Thank God that we can go to Him and we can look to Him. Again, John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Then in John 20, 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that uh, uh, she had seen the Lord and that He had spoken these things unto her. You know, what a privilege for this to be uh, the first one to see the Lord. And uh, it was a woman. It wasn't His disciples. And you say, well, why, why did that happen? I don't know. I just know that it did. Now, I, I can say something out of life's experience. Uh, a lot of times, women are more open and receptive to the Word of God and to the Holy Spirit than us old hard-hearted men are. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that's why I say that a lot of times, I consider the woman to be the Holy Spirit of the home. Because she has charge over the children. She rears them. She uh, corrects them. She teaches them. Uh, well, the man's not around a lot of times. Now, that's not taking anything away from the man. But I believe that's the way God set it up. And, uh, you know, we follow God's pathway. I believe the, the mother should look to the husband, and the husband should look to God and get direction. And I believe the children should look to the parents, and the parents should look to God, and they get direction. That's the way God set it up. And yet we want to change that today. We want to go some other direction. And, and again, what a privilege to go and to tell others, He lives. He lives. Uh, Mark 16, 9 says this, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, He appeared unto Mary Magdalene, out of whom He cast seven devils. Now, two disciples, Peter and John, were found at the tomb. They found a linen clothes in place. They found a napkin apart. Jesus had risen. The one devoted follower named Mary met the angels, heard the message, and she turned to see the Master, and Jesus gave her the message of going and telling. Now, He's given us the message to go and to tell. Some people call it visitation. Some people call it soul winning. No matter what it is, we need to go. Right. And we do have something to tell. You say, tell, tell them what? He's alive. He's alive. Right, man. We serve a risen Savior. That's right. He's in the world today. Amen. Hmm. And if you know He's living, I guarantee you, He'll come out of you <coughs> somewhere, some way, somehow. Remember we studied about those secret disciples last week? They weren't so secret, were they? Because they come and got the body from Pilate who had the power to kill him. And yet they begged the body of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for uh, our resurrection Savior. And I thank you tonight that we know that he lives and God, I pray that we'll be a light and a witness and we'll tell others. I pray you'll bless Brother Shoemate as he comes uh, shortly. And God, you'll give him power and liberty tonight and freedom as he teaches. God, to impart uh, what you've given him concerning uh, our heritage and our history uh, concerning the Baptist. And I pray that you'll bless uh, each home, each person, each church that's represented in this uh, classroom tonight. And help us always to be a light and to be a witness for Christ. That we might uplift his name and to tell a lost world that he's worth the uh, serving. Guide us now and direct us and we give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.
Miska. 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 Miska.